Okay, hello, welcome pre -Caps D. We're going to do a review of the inverse trig functions. And, okay, um, this is something that you learned last year with Mr. Kirk. And um, it's certainly possible that you learned this topic uh, perfectly, um, and then this would be a total waste of time for you. But, I've been doing this for 15 years, and I find that um, students for whatever reason, find this topic to be really difficult, and uh, they don't learn it properly the first time, and, um, well, some students do, but many don't, and it's really important, and so, uh, to the extent that pre-calc C is also kind of a review of pre-calc A and B, and getting us ready for calculus is one of the most important things in calculus, so, we're going to do a review of this. Now, I'm kind of cheating, uh, because normally I will use 45 minutes of our precious class time in Precoc C to do this review, but instead I'm just making you watch it on video, so that's kind of uh, annoying of me. Uh, and uh, arguably the activity is best done live, where you're just kind of sitting in class and forcing yourself to kind of go through the logic of it all over again. So uh, anyway, I'm really sorry about this. You kind of, this is sort of a doing thing, not a watching thing. So. Um, Probably no one's going to listen to me, but you should um, try to do this uh, and stay ahead of me, uh, not just watch me do it. Uh, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, well, uh, in live, the activity would involve uh, you taking out a piece of paper, uh, folding it uh, in t into six uh, squares, uh, so giving us uh, six squares on the front and six squares on the back. And um, with those 12 boxes, we're going to graph from hand, by hand, from memory, uh, with understanding, the uh, six trig functions and the six inverse trig functions. And this is me kind of saying to you, yeah, you really need to kind of know this stuff uh, pretty, pretty much solid. Okay, so, uh, because I have this limited board space, which is very frustrating, it makes me cry every day, um, I'm going to just do them two at a time, I suppose. Uh, and erase. So, uh, first, everybody, kind of uh, pause now, pause the video now, and please graph, uh, sine, and, and cosine. Okay, I'll just keep going, um, but anyway, uh, what does the sine function look like? What does the cosine function look like? Well, okay, I don't know exactly um, what Mr. Kirk does with you, but uh, usually when I say graph sine, I want you to graph just just one period of sine. So if that's 2 pi, this is pi. And uh, okay, maybe I will try to, to use, um, well, uh, that's negative pi. I'll try to use uh, purple for the, for the graph itself. Um, I just have memorized, without going into the exact logic of this all over again, I've sort of memorized that the sine function looks like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, good. And also maybe just let's throw in a little bit of that too, just because. Okay, so there's there's my beautiful, gorgeous uh, sine function. And, and to me, uh, you've really graphed sine when you have sort of one, uh, well, when you have these kind of five points uh, labeled. Um, and this point here is uh, pi over two, and that's, that's one, and, and this is three pi over two. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, what's the, well, okay, okay, I'll just graph cosine now. Also, it's the same uh, kind of thing. Uh, what is the definition of sine? Well, you have a unit circle, and you <laughs> have a point uh, on the unit circle, uh, and uh, the input to the sine function is uh, kind of the, the length of this arc. So this arc is, is x, and uh, then uh, the sine function is just is that height. So cha cha, that's sine x. Okay, and uh, well, uh, with the cosine uh, function, uh, uh, once again, I've just kind of memorized it. So boom 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 boom. Uh, cosine kind of uh, starts high. Uh, what is uh, cosine? Well, it's just the uh, by definition, it's uh, this uh, bit. It's the um, horizontal uh, component uh, of this 
point on the unit circle with arc length x. Those are like the real definitions. And so uh, basically uh, that uh, any point on the unit circle uh, has coordinates sine x comma cosine x where um, uh, x is the, is, the length, uh, is the length of the arc uh, starting from 1, 0, sort of wrapping around the circle. Okay, anyway, uh, let's just do this. So um, trying to be a little bit uh, neat. Uh, this is pi, 2 pi, etc. Okay. Uh, so, all right, the cosine function, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, and by the time I get to pi over 2, uh, my x-coordinate is, is 0. By the time I get to pi, my, uh, my x-coordinate is negative 1. By the, time I get to, by the time I wrap 3 pi over 2 around the circle, my x-coordinate is back to 0, and by the time I get all the way around the circle, uh, my x-coordinate is back to being 1. So, okay, this time I did sort of re-derive the whole shape of the cosine curve for you. And there it is. Okay, well, uh, well, well, what now? Now um, that we have done all of this, uh, it's time to graph the inverse functions. Okay, what are the inverse functions? Uh, well, what is an inverse function uh, in general? Uh, it's the function which sort of takes you back uh, kind of where you came from. Uh, so uh, the, the, the sine function uh, takes as input an angle and outputs kind of a y-coordinate. So the arcsine function is going to um, take a y-coordinate and uh, output uh, the angle. Um, but immediately we see a problem when it comes to taking the inverse of this sine function. The problem is that this function is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, and uh, in fact, you can see by taking, say, pi over 3, that when you, you take the sine of, um, yeah, when you take the sine of uh, pi over 3, you get uh, root 3 over 2, but when you take the sine of 2 pi over 3, you also get root 3 over 2. And therefore, there are two points on the sine function which both give answer root 3 over 2. Uh, and therefore, if I were to naively uh, take as my arc sine function just all the ordered pairs with the order reversed, which is kind of what an inverse is, then we'd have a problem because uh, to, to what angle should root 3 over 2 be associated with? Uh, and you, you don't want this uh, situation in which uh, f of uh, root 3 over 2 equals pi over 3 and um, uh, and f of uh, root 3 over 2 uh, equals 2 pi over 3, that would be just uh, chaos uh, and uh, confusion, uh, and that would be sort of not a function at all. But I'm explicitly uh, designing this function arcsine to be a function, therefore it needs to be uh, sort of the inverse function, and so I have to remove this kind of behavior, uh, which is causing root 3 over 2 to want to be two different things. All right, so how do I do this? Well, there's a method for uh, dealing with non-one-to-one -one functions uh, that you nonetheless want to, to construct the inverse for. You have to restrict the domain first. And so what we now do is in a completely arbitrary process, um, which there's no particularly very, very strong reason why it has to be this way, except we just decide to do it this way, we take a, a, a only some of the sine function. And specifically, we go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And you just have to memorize this fact uh, because it's arbitrary. Um, there's no reason why we did this, so therefore the fact that we do it this way is something you just have to know. And okay, what have I really done? I have uh, sort of, what I'm now going to do is ignore the rest of the sine function and only focus on the sine function between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And now, this function, on this interval, is one-to-one. -one. Uh, for every uh, y value, there is only one x value that points to it. And so now, we perform the uh, sort of coordinate swapping to construct the arcsine function from the inverse of this, uh, from the inverse, we perform the coordinate swapping uh, transformation on this restricted function. Okay, and that's pretty much all there is to say. Why did we choose from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2? Well, it's a nice chunk. It's all together in one area. You get the entire range. The range of sine function is negative 1 to 1, so that's still the range here. 
And uh, yeah, it's just symmetric about the origin. It's odd. It's, you get all this kind of nice stuff. Okay, so then it's it's really just that simple. Uh, the arc sine function, uh, therefore, is going to you know look the other way because there's a point zero zero. There will still be a point zero zero because when you take sine of pi over two, you get one. Uh, when you take the arc sine of one, you're going to get pi over two. Cha, and uh, because when you plug negative pi over 2 into sine, you get negative 1. Uh, well, that means that when I plug uh, negative 1 into arc sine, I will get negative pi over 2. And then, when it comes to graphing it, uh, you have to graph uh, sort of things uh, kind of reflected across the line y equals x. And so here you have this kind of horizontal tangent, uh, and then ja. So now you're going to have... Um, uh, kind of a vertical tangent, which is just another way of saying the orientation kind of flips and you get this something that looks like this. Okay, so that's arc sine, and uh, that's kind of really all there is to it. Uh, constructing this graph uh, is comes from, from this graph, and, and this graph comes from this restriction that you need to memorize. All right, and then sort of the important thing, uh, in addition to having the graph of arc sine, is this kind of uh, sort of other picture uh, you might say, associated with arc sine, which is, uh, on the unit circle, uh, I should now be thinking, okay, what is the range of arc sine? The range of arc sine is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Therefore, since the range of arc sine is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, then I need to kind of mentally, uh, and this is maybe what you did last year, think of a unit circle and think of the values from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 as being uh, the possible outputs to arc sine. And so, now, when someone says, hey, what's the arc sine of, say, uh, negative a half, uh, you have an answer. Because though there are an infinite number of angles whose sine is negative a half, I'm looking for the particular angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is negative a half. And there's only one uh, angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, whose sine is negative half, and that is negative pi over 6. And so that's just the answer. Okay, going a lot faster now, uh, what's up with arc cosine? Well, okay, similar kind of situation. I just uh, have to uh, deal with this cosine function first because it's not one-to-one. -one. Uh, in fact, no periodic function can be one-to-one, -one. Not, not really, except for some maybe weird exceptions. Uh, so we have to restrict the domain because, you know, this cosine function is going on and on and on forever. Uh, so it's very, very much not one-to-one -one for any y value that comes up. It comes up an infinite number of times. So I have to restrict the domain of cosine. Uh, how do we do it? We have some kind of psychological preference for, for positive uh, numbers. So I guess we're going to just take this chunk between uh, 0 and pi. Uh, it's a nice chunk to take. It covers the entire range of the cosine function from negative 1 to 1. Uh, okay, and then, uh, having made that decision, which you need to memorize, uh, we then get to graph uh, our cosine. Well, what does it look like? Now when I plug 0 into cosine, I get 1. So when I plug 1 into our cosine, I get 0. When I plug z uh, pi over 2 into cosine, I get back 0. So now when I plug 0 into our cosine, I get pi over 2. And when I plug in pi into cosine, I get negative 1. So now when I plug in negative 1, I get uh, pi. And the graph looks something like this. So that's the graph of our cosine. That's decent. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, now, uh, again, this kind of picture needs to be on your mind, which is this one. Um, what kinds of things does the arc cosine function output? What is the range of arc cosine? Answer, the range of arc cosine is everything from 0 to pi. And, of course, the range of arc cosine is just the domain of the restricted function. So when you're memorizing this, district, this restriction, what you're really memorizing is the range of possible outputs of arc cosine. And so, when someone asks for, uh, say, uh, well, arc cosine of, well, I'll just do negative a half again, now there are an infinite number of angles whose whose cosine is negative a half, but I need to answer, uh, I need to answer 
what is the particular uh, angle uh, between 0 and pi whose cosine is negative a half? And then there's only one answer, that answer is 2 pi over 3. Okay, that was a basic uh, review of uh, these two sort of basic trig functions and, and what's the big sort of idea of what we're doing and what we're trying to do and why. Um, but then there are four more trig functions that you need to be also very, very comfortable with and you're probably less familiar with those. So let's do those now, but, um, you know, sort of we're going to go on the one hand more quickly because I have less to say, because uh, I think you, you get the gist now, but also maybe the functions are harder to grasp. So what you should do if you want to be like a superstar, what you would do now is uh, just pause the video and, you know, graph from your own memory or using your wits, um, tan, secant, cosecant, and cotan. And I'll do, I guess I'll just do, I guess, well, I'm just going to do it. I'll do tan, I suppose, and cotan, uh, and then I will do secant and cosecant. Okay, sha 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 sha. Got to go kind of fast, I think, a little bit here because my family is coming home, so there might be some kids in this video. Uh, so, all right, what does the tan function look like? Well, I more or less just have this one memorized, that um, uh, tan has asymptotes at uh, negative pi over 2 uh, and pi over 2. So, uh, and, and, and other ones as well. Uh, so then that's, that's like pi, and then that's uh, 3 pi over 2. Okay, so it's very hard to, to see green, I suppose. Maybe that's better, maybe worse. Uh, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, negative pi over 2. And then the tan function, you know, it looks, it looks like this. Um, why? Well, okay, uh, there's a lot of reasons. But I, I suppose if you wanted to sort of go back to the, to the definition of the unit circle, uh, tan... Uh, of any angle is defined to be y over x, and so you can uh, convince yourself that uh, if you if you um, take uh, an angle of zero, then the the tan is also zero, and if you take an angle which is a tiny bit less than pi over two, now the y coordinate is almost one, but the x coordinate is very 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 tiny, so one over very 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 tiny is going to be huge. Uh, but if you take a number which is a little bit more than pi over 2, uh, well now uh, the y coordinate is just still almost 1, but now the x coordinate is a tiny negative. And when you do 1 divided by a tiny negative, you get like negative uh, infinity, which is why uh, tan, when uh, theta is a little bit more than pi over 2, tan is, is, is way down there. Okay, uh, of course this function is not 1 to 1, uh, so we have to, uh, because it's periodic functions, we have to restrict the domain. And we choose to restrict the domain to be everything between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, uh, cotan, uh, okay, a little bit more uh, obscure, I suppose. Uh, this one, once again, I've memorized uh, correctly, uh, has uh, asymptotes at pi and 2 pi. Hold on, I'll redo that in purple. Um, yeah, pi and 2 pi, yeah. Uh, okay, why is this true? Well, cotan theta is x over y. So all right, you just sort of repeat this argument a little bit. Uh, now, uh, if you take a point which is a tiny bit more than 0, I guess, um, x over y is going to be uh, almost 1 over a very tiny positive. So cotan is going to be is going to be kind of huge now, and then when you go to by the time you get to pi over two, uh, x is zero, so cotan will be zero. But by the time you get over here to being a little bit less than pi, now x over y is going to be like net almost negative one over a tiny tiny positive. So that's going to be negative one over a tiny tiny positive is a huge negative. And then, okay, I don't know if this is helping anybody, but if you give me a number a little bit more than pi now, uh, now x and y are both negative, so it's positive again, uh, but still your x coordinate is almost 1, your y coordinate is very tiny, so we're back up to being positive infinity. So, all right, 
this is how a responsible, uh, focused student might sort of re-derive the, from the very first time what the graph of cotan looks like, which is uh, respectable, but also you should just kind of know it. I just know it by heart, but you can reason now uh, the way I've done here. <gasps> Well, now, well, I have to restrict the domain of cotin. This one is mildly controversial in that 98% of people agree that the correct restriction to cotin is from zero to pi. But there are a couple of stickers out there who do it, who do it differently, like Wolfram Alpha, so we just won't talk about that. Okay, uh, great. Having uh, produced the graphs of tan and cotin, having memorized the, the relevant restrictions, I will now make the graph of arctan um, and uh, arccotan. Uh, okay, uh, let's do it. Um, well, uh, this is a little bit trickier because it's sort of like infinity is kind of involved somehow. And okay, well, I guess the way to do this is to see that because um, uh, tan has vertical asymptotes at uh, x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals pi over 2, then arctan is going to have horizontal asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. And if we want to just uh, construct the graph, what we can do is we can say, okay, when I plug in 0, I get back 0, so still that will be the same. If x is a little bit less than pi over 2, uh, y is like infinity. Therefore, sort of swapping a little bit less than pi over 2 comma infinity gives me infinity comma a little bit less than pi over 2. Which is to say that as arctan, uh, as, as the input to arctan becomes infinite, the output is a little bit less than pi over 2. We're just swapping coordinates. Uh, and uh, as I go, uh, as x approaches Negative infinity, y approaches negative pi over 2. So now as, the, as x approaches negative um, infinity, uh, y will approach a little bit more than negative pi over 2. Okay, uh, and it might help you potentially to have like maybe one more point or something like that. Like what is that point? That's uh, pi over 4 comma 1. Uh, and uh, this point right here is negative pi over 4, comma, negative 1, and if that helps you anchor things a little bit better, well then, you know, we, we, we get one of those again, right? That's, um, that's uh, 1, comma, pi over 4, and uh, this point right here is negative 1, comma, negative pi over 4. Okay. Uh, good. Anyway, there's our 10. Uh, what's the significance of this? Well... Uh, what it means is that, just from looking at the graph, we can see that the output of arctan is always something between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Therefore, when I'm actually computing with arctan, when I'm taking the arctan, uh, when I'm using the arctan function to compute a value, I should be always expecting something between uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And therefore, if someone asks me for uh, the arctan of, say, um, uh, negative root 3, say, uh, well, then I should uh, say to myself, okay, what is the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 uh, for which the arctan is negative root 3? And the answer is going to be this one down here, uh, where the y coordinate is uh, negative root 3 over 2 and the x coordinate is negative 1 half. Uh, that will have a ratio y to x of, sorry, uh, positive a half, comma, negative root 3 over 2. Uh, and so uh, the answer to this problem is negative pi over 3. Okay, and you need to be able to sort of do that kind of immediately. Okay, uh, here we go. For the graph of arc cotan, let me do this one a little bit uh, faster. Uh, once again, the asymptotes just swap, and I just get that there's this asymptote up here at y equals pi. And now uh, there was a point sort of pi over 2 comma 0, so there will be a point 0 comma pi over 2. And now when x is a tiny bit, when x is a tiny positive, y is infinity. So therefore when here, when x is infinity, y will be a tiny positive. And uh, that was a little ugly, but this is pretty much right. Uh, 
as x approaches a little bit less than pi, y approaches negative infinity, thus for, on the inverse graph, as x approaches negative infinity, y will approach a little bit less than pi. Okay, so that makes uh, complete sense. And now uh, I just have to memorize uh, this restriction from zero to pi. Uh, the implications of that restriction are that the output of arc cotan, which is probably the least important of the, of the six uh, as well, uh, is always going to be between zero and pi. And so if someone asks me for the arc cotan of, I don't know, um, say, uh, 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 root 3 over 3, uh, then that's the answer to that question is, what is the angle between 0 and pi with uh, the arc cotan being uh, 1 over root 3? And the answer is, it's going to be this point up here with coordinates 1 half comma root 3 over 2. I think I did that correctly. Uh, yeah, because uh, it's for that point, uh, which, and the answer will be pi over 3, because it's at pi over 3 that x over y, so 1 over root 3, which is root 3 over 3. So if you followed all that, good. If not, think about that a little bit more. Okay, uh, moving right along. This is some beautiful pictures here. Uh, let's do the last two uh, problems. Uh, okay, pause it if you need to or whatever. Uh, please uh, graph secant and graph cosecant from memory, and then we will graph arc secant and arc cosecant, and then that'll be it. Okay. Secant, cosecant. Okay, we do it. Well, you either know this by heart, or you have to uh, know at least something. Uh, and one thing to know is that uh, secant is, is 1 over the x-coordinate. So this is the reciprocal of cosine. So if it helps you to have kind of the, the reciprocal, to have the cosine graph kind of just lingering there, this is perhaps how Kirk, how, how Kirk teaches this, then the secant graph is going to be the reciprocal of that. And if it's the reciprocal of that, uh, then uh, when uh, cosine is zero, the reciprocal of zero is going to be like infinite. And that's why you get these asymptotes here uh, at, at, at everywhere where cosine uh, is, is zero. And so the graph of secant kind of goes like this. Cha and like cha. And when people tell me uh, to graph, uh, so, and, and this, this here is, um, this is pi over 2, this is negative pi over 2, these are the places where cosine is 0, that's pi, and that's 3 pi over 2 is, the, is that other asymptote. Uh, when people tell me to, to graph secant, uh, this is sort of what I graph, from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. Okay, uh, how about uh, cosecant? Uh, well, um, okay. Uh, this cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so perhaps it's helpful to to have the graph of sine uh, in your in your brain or whatever. Uh, and there's there's sine. Uh, so uh, okay, uh, not the most beautiful sine there, but it's all right. Uh, and then uh, what does the the cosecant look like? Well, uh, whenever sine is zero, which happens at negative pi. Uh, at 0 and at uh, pi and 2 pi, you know, that's where, um, that's where cosecant uh, will be um, uh, undefined. Uh, okay, uh, so what does cosecant uh, look like? Well, when sine is, is 1, cosecant is also 1. Uh, when you take the reciprocal of a tiny positive, it's a huge positive. Uh, reciprocal of a tiny positive, huge positive. Reciprocal of negative 1 is still negative 1 and reciprocal of a tiny negative is an infinite negative. And so we get something like this. This is pi over 2. Uh, that's pi. Uh, that's uh, 3 pi over 2. And that's 2 pi. And personally, when someone tells me to graph secant, that's, that's what I graph. Uh, the interval from 0 to 2 pi. 
Okay, now I want the inverses. So once again, uh, I need to uh, be careful uh, prior to uh, constructing my inverse arc secant arc co. Uh, I need to be careful uh, prior to construct my inverses to make sure that my function is is one to one. And uh, okay, of course these functions are not one to one; they're infinite uh, and periodic. Well. What is the conventional restriction here? This is a little bit less obvious what to do uh, because there's all this kind of stuff, but the range of secant is everything from one to infinity and everything from negative infinity to negative one. So I want to restrict the range of my secant function in such a way that uh, that entire range is preserved, but I want there to be only, for every y value, I want there to be only one x value which points to it. Okay, so once again, sort of preserving the preference for, for positive numbers over negatives, um, I get this, and I get uh, this. Uh, in other words, I restrict the domain of secant to be everything from 0 to pi, not counting pi over 2. And now uh, I get the entire range still, from 1 to infinity and from negative infinity to negative 1, uh, but for every y value, there's only one x value, which is to say uh, this is one to one. Uh, for cosecant, there are many choices which are reasonable, but the best choice is to do the same, th and the choice which everyone made, so you don't really get a choice, is to do the same thing uh, as the restriction for sine. Uh, and that is to take everything from uh, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 not counting zero. In other words, I grab this kind of central piece uh, from negative pi over two uh, to pi over two uh, as my, uh, as my uh, piece of cosecant that I'm going to, uh, to, to, to make the inverse out of. And uh, once again, I preserve the entire range and it's nice and symmetric about the origin, so that's pretty good. Okay, uh, good. Uh, now we just do it. Um, so, all right. The arc secant function doesn't come up every day, but it's kind of important. Uh, I'm just wrapping up this video. Well, let's see, what do I do? Uh, zero, when I plug zero into secant, I get back one. So when I plug one into uh, arc secant, I'll get, back, um, I'll get back zero. When I plug in pi, I get back negative one. So now when I plug in negative one, I will get back uh, pi, cha-cha, there is a uh, vertical asymptote at x equals pi over 2, so I should sort of expect a horizontal asymptote at y equals uh, pi over 2. And now, uh, looking at this kind of carefully, what is this sort of saying to me? Well, if x is a little bit less than pi over 2, y goes off to infinity. Thus, on the inverse graph, as I go off to infinity, my y-coordinate will approach a number a little bit less than pi over 2. So what we get is like that. And over here, uh, if I'm a number, if I plug into secant a number a little bit more than pi over 2, I get back negative infinity. So on the inverse graph, when I go out to negative infinity, I'm going to end up with a number a little bit less than pi over 2. So I get kind of this. So that is how you uh, reproduce the, the graph of arc secant. Uh, let's do it over here quickly with arc cosecant. Uh, now, because there's a vertical asymptote at uh, 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 x equals zero, I'm going to expect a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. Uh, because when I plug in pi over two into cosecant, I get back one, uh, then that means on the inverse graph, when I plug in one, I'm going to get back uh, pi over 2. Uh, I think I'm doing that right, although my picture's kind of bad. Um, okay, uh, cha. And then uh, when I plug in negative pi over 2, when I plug in negative pi over 2, I get back negative 1 for cosecant. So now when I plug in uh, negative 1, I get back negative pi over 2. So this is me just swapping coordinates. And now, to, to figure out the rest of the graph, uh, sorry, there's no zero, zero. That was just me getting distracted. 
uh, I just have these two points so far, those two big uh, green dots, I just transfer them here, but swapping coordinates. And now, finally, if x is a tiny positive number, the cosecant of it is like positive infinity. So on the inverse cosecant graph, as I approach positive infinity, my output should be a number which is a tiny positive. In other words, I have this kind of asymptotic behavior uh, towards the positive origin, or towards the, the, the towards the x-axis, uh, just above it. And finally, over here, if you plug in a tiny negative number, uh, cosecant outputs like negative infinity. So on the inverse graph, as I approach negative infinity, I'm going to output a number which is a tiny uh, negative number. So, okay, that completes the graphs. Uh, the last thing to do is to sort of uh, link this to uh, arc secant in a kind of a way, uh, what kinds of outputs I should expect. And the answer is that the range of arc secant is everything from 0 to pi, uh, not counting pi over 2. So that's 0, that's pi, and uh, pi over 2 is, is, is kind of missing. So uh, that's just the interval that we restricted secant to. Uh, thus, that becomes the range of arc secant. Thus, any time uh, we try to uh, uh, output, uh, um, uh, that's something we're going to take the arc secant of something, I'm always going to be outputting an angle between 0 and pi. And so if you ask me for the arc secant of uh, negative 2, for example, uh, well, now I'm basically saying, okay, uh, what point, what angle between 0 and pi uh, has an arc secant of negative 2? Well, that's going to be one with a cosine of negative a half, and therefore it's that point right here, uh, 2 pi over 3, uh, which has a cosine of negative a half, therefore secant of negative 2, therefore the answer to this problem is 2 pi over 3. And uh, to go over here, uh, arc cosecant is always going to output something uh, between uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Uh, so negative pi over 2 and uh, pi over 2, not counting 0. So that's just because that's how we restricted cosecant. And so... Uh, I should be always expecting something in, in that interval. And so if someone asks me for uh, arc, uh, sec, arc, and arc cosecant of negative 2, say, now they're saying, okay, what angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 has a cosecant of negative 2, which is saying like, which is saying like where the sine is negative a half, and the sine is negative a half, right here, and so the one and only one answer to this is negative pi over 6. Okay, that is a review of the inverse trig functions. Uh, so, uh, there it is. Goodbye.